the first Kurosawa film I think I ever saw was Throne of Blood uh, on the Z Channel. A uh, Fellini film, I Vitalone. There was a picture called Spider Stratagem. Sam Pekimba, Wild Bunch. The Straw Dogs, uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. The Story of Adele H. Rear Window, Midnight Cowboy. Ikuru. Song remains the same. Johnny Guitar. The Onion Field. Los Olvidados. Man Who Fell to Earth. Every film that Marlon Brando was ever in. Z Channel. Z Channel. Z Channel. Our salvation. Uncharted territory. Like Tom Toms in the jungle. <laughs> Jerry Harvey. Jerry Harvey. Programmer. An obsessive programmer. Dark and negative and maverick. Nurturing. Skating that line between insanity and genius. What do you think the secret of the Z Channel success is? I don't know. If I told you, then it wouldn't be a secret. My father says there's only right and wrong, good and evil, nothing in between. It isn't that simple, is it? No, it isn't. It should be, but it isn't. Okay, next news time, 6.06, a Hollywood story with a tragic ending this morning. The bodies of Z Channel programmer Jerry Harvey and his wife Derry Rudolph were discovered Saturday night in their Westwood home. Police report Harvey shot and killed Rudolph, his wife of two years, before turning the gun on himself. The motive is unknown. Harvey had been chief programmer at Z Channel, which is known throughout Los Angeles for its eclectic and innovative programming. Both Harvey and Rudolph were 39 years old. So it was back in 1974, and uh, I just started selling cable television, and the Z Channel had just started. So we came up here to the Hollywood Hills, and it was really great because these people had terrible reception. They couldn't see anything on their television, and not only were we offering good reception, we gave them movies, uncut and no commercials, in their bedroom, in their living room, wherever they wanted it. They ate it up. It was very, very successful. It was amazing. I had friends over all the time because they showed two movies a night, as I recall, and they were uncut, uninterrupted. It was this phenomenon no one had ever seen. It. Theta in the Z Channel was the only one in the major cities. In other words, New York did not have it at the time. Los Angeles was the first one to do that. That this actually existed, you could see this stuff, was incredible. So I was like, we've got to get this. So I was living in El Segundo at the time. and. Um, my mom called up and, no, Zeke Channel wasn't in our area. Not only was Theta in that area along the foothills, but it was who was in the homes in the, along the foothills, and those were the folks that ran the, the movie industry. They were films for the whole family, but I thought slanted to adults a little bit, and those are the films I tried to get. Chinatown was on a lot in those days. They used to run it a lot. And that was one of my favorite movies, and I ended up seeing it, you know, like three or four times a week at, at certain points. I publicized the shows that we were doing in the Hollywood trade papers, Variety and Reporter, and gradually word began to spread. I think it's interesting, too, to note that in that time, it's hard to remember this. I tell my kids about it, and they don't believe me, but there was a time when there was no blockbuster stores. There was no, uh, no video cassettes. There was none of that existed. You have to understand this is before HBO, before Showtime, before any of that. And it was really, really groundbreaking. When I left, Hal Kaufman, uh, he took my place. I remember he had an assistant who he hired, uh, Jerry Harvey. And that was my first contact with Jerry Harvey. Uh, the Z Channel hired uh, 
a person that really made the Z Channel, probably put the Z Channel on the map, and that's Jerry Harvey. Jerry probably is one of those students that a teacher encounters ever so often and thinks, hmm, I think this student's probably smarter than I am. <laughs> I had just broken up with my girlfriend, and so I was standing at the Dixon Art Center looking rather forlorn, apparently, and he kind of recognized the look and walked up to me and said, I recognize the look, and so we started talking, and we spent the entire day, you know, having lunch and talking about movies, and that's how we met. Uh, so many of my students, when they're interested in movies, are only interested in the, the art movies, the the indies. Um, Jerry Jerry loved them all, uh, and and hated them all when they were bad. With Jerry, you always talked about movies. Everything that he, his entire frame of reference was films. I started getting these weekly telephone calls toward the end of each week from this obviously very young, intense young man asking me for a rundown of what the good pictures were going to be that particular week. I think the first contact or the memory I have of Jerry Harvey was when he was uh, booking the Beverly Cannon. I heard about Jerry's work long before I heard about Jerry because I heard about his work for the Beverly Cannon. I was going to Cal Arts, an art school 30 miles north of Los Angeles, and everybody was talking about the Beverly Cannon, especially when he ran the Uncut Wild Bunch. I mean, that was like a missile blast. Everybody, every, anybody who loved film knew about this. And on a rainy day in, uh, at the Beverly Cannon Theater, 2,000 people or however many people showed up for, for the screening. I think a great coup in his life happened because Peckinpah arrived with the print. And it certainly was momentous because it, you know, his bond with Peckinpah just extended from there. Jerry certainly was one of the people that looked up to Sam as, a, I guess, kind of a father figure. Jerry felt that way about a number of creative people that, that he admired and appreciated. He was always surprising me. It was Sam this and Bob that, and I thought, whoa, how did you get to meet these people? That he arranged a screening for, for uh, some call it loving there. Uh, you, you can't help but respect someone who has taken all the time and effort to educate himself, become familiar with, with not only my films, which, which uh, the ones I did with Kubrick, of course, weren't obscure, but some call it loving was kind of an obscure film. I met Jerry Harvey in my mother's living room. She worked with Jim Harris at the time, and they were friends, and I came bounding into her house, and he was standing there. It was kind of love at first sight, I think. We stayed on the phone that night after he left my house for 11 hours. He came over the next night after that, and I don't think he ever left for three years. He had aspirations to be a filmmaker, or, uh, you know, at least to start out as a, a, a screenwriter. We wrote a script together about two college kids who uh, were, were witness to a murder. And that's, that's how we really started writing together. And we ended up getting the agency off of that, meeting Monty Hellman. Jerry w was also involved in the making of a film, uh, a Western that, that uh, he had written, I believe and that uh, he was able to raise the financing and went over to Italy to do it. Are you satisfied now? You ain't gonna last long, son. There ain't no soft-hearted gunfighters. China 9 was really great fun. I can always remember we flew into Rome, landed in Rome, was picked up by the limo at the airport, and then went to Almeria. We had a great group of people. Warren Oates was there. Fabio Testi, uh, Jenny Agater, Sam Peckinpah, Dumonte Hellman. We just had the best time, one of the best times of my life. There was, of course, a tremendous uh, black period when <clears throat> his sister Anne committed suicide. Jerry spoke to his sister all the time. They were very, very close. 
uh, great friends, uh, and he adored her. Anne checked herself into a hospital when Jerry was gone. And I believe that uh, she was waiting for him to come back. She had left a suicide tape that was her talking to Jerry while she died, explaining you know, everything that had transpired in her life that led to this decision. She was really his anchor. And not only did she go mad, but now she was gone. And he came back um, to have this happen. And by the time I saw him, he was crazy. I'd never seen him so crazy. We got married pretty quickly after that. We got married in, um, in February 1978. Part of what was really attractive about it at the time was that we'd already been having this affair, but then he was just so vulnerable and reaching out. And, and so I blamed the things that I saw that seemed dark and scary to me, I blamed on the fact that he was in mourning over his sister and assumed that my loving him would make those things go away and be better. We were still very close friends, but we weren't really uh, partners in activity. We didn't write anything together after that. We, we never did. At the time, there was only select TV and on TV as cable sources in the area that I lived. We had gotten um, select TV, and in the middle of the night, he would wake me up yelling at the television because the programming sucked. And at some point in time, I just said, if you hate it so much, either don't watch it or write a letter. And so he wrote a letter to them telling them what was wrong with the programming. And they called him and said, how do you know so much? And who are you? And we want to talk to you. And Jerry had said he had found these movies that, you know, since we were playing eclectic things, here's some, you know, want to show me something. Greece withdraws from NATO. The third guarantor power, Britain, with air force and troops on the spot, sticks to her policy of strict non-involvement. You know, it was a documentary about the invasion of Greece by the Turks and, you know, political content. It was an interesting movie. It, was, it had just been this guy who had written in this letter, could, was reading the reaction and was like, okay, well, that didn't get him, so let me try one more. And, and, uh, and I think it was like a Laura Antonelli film, who I'd never seen before, and it was staggeringly gorgeous. And I thought anybody who could go to these kind of, you know, the, that, those polls, to the utter pure documentary, political documentary to sex is, is worth having, so I hired him. And so that sort of set Jerry on his path, which seemed really hopeful because then there was something that really was about his passion, um, something that he could do that was positive and that would give him something to focus on besides his own, you know, struggle with with himself. Hal Kaufman, the guy running um, Z at the time, called Jerry and approached him about a job. I left Select, and weeks after I got to uh, Z, the head of programming fell ill and left and never came back. Everything that predated Z and his own eminence over Z was merely the prep. You know, it was the years in the desert. Boom, suddenly Jerry arrives in the early 80s and he's known all through town. He dropped me on the phone and he said, Jerry, he said, uh, I've been hired and uh, I want to do a new spin on the pictures that we're showing. I think I got a call from somebody once, picked up the phone, and somebody on the phone said to me, this is Jerry Harvey. I buy movies, do you have so-and-so? I think so-and-so was probably Black Orpheus. When you first met him, I think he was cold and distant. We, we had to generate a mutual respect, which came quickly because we found out that each of us had an interest in old movies, um, different movies, movies that were unloved, movies that had been unscreened. Telephone, Miss Gray. Thank you. Excuse me. She'll take it here. No, never mind. Ask them to call me at home later, please. Bring the phone. What was so brilliant about what Jerry was doing was mixing the art film with commercial fare. <laughs> I had to see everything on this crash course. It was like the Schick Center for movie addiction. And then I had to hear him recite to me, Dr. Strangelove, 
There was a month when I heard scenes from Dr. Strangelove from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. I agree with you. It's great to be fine. <laughs> now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. Z was great for him. Z was, you know, Jerry sort of found his, his place there because he could come in. I mean, Jerry's favorite way of dressing was, you know, a business shirt not tucked in, uh, a nice jacket, baggy, dirty jeans, and uh, fry boots, you know, and he couldn't do that working in a corporate situation. So at Z Channel, he could do what he liked to do best, which is sit cross-legged on the floor and make his phone calls that way. Smoking. When did you start looking at films? To be honest with you, when I was four. Yes. yes. I remember vividly a film I saw at four and the impact it had on me for a great period of my life. It meant more to me than anything else, movies, the history of movies, and seeing them. This man, Jerry Harvey, this very sweet, very odd man, called me up and very tentatively asked me, would I like a safe place, my first film, to be on television? I was sure he made a mistake because it was a film that was so trashed by all the critics when it opened that I, I, nobody wanted to play it. Uh, yes. Yes, I have missed you. Do you want to know why? Because you're very simple-minded. Screw you. I had a film called Images that I had done in, in shot in Ireland in 72. And he was particularly, Jerry liked that film a lot. He said, why can't we, let's run that on the Z channel. Well, we couldn't find who owned the title. He said, well, I'll run it if you'll run it. I said, well, I'll run it if you'll run it. So here's the print. Catherine, what are you talking about, Catherine? I love you. Don't. You don't. You know, these films are, get lost in a hurry. And I would get calls, hey, they just played your movie on Z Channel. I'm naked now. I, know, I mean, that was like, uh, you know, a big release for me. <laughs> if you couldn't get a studio to release your picture, your picture did not get seen. One of the big things that changed that was the Z Channel. The Z Channel to me was the first time I could speak French. Z Channel. And it was the first time you could turn on your television and see something that you would have to go to the cinema for. What he was doing was coming up with films that I had never heard of or didn't know existed. People saw movies that they wouldn't have gone to see in a theater if they were free. And consequently, I think it was both a pleasurable experience and an educational experience. And I think it widened everybody's horizons. It made, I think, even the powers that be realize that there was this alternate audience that was much larger than anybody knew. Jerry found all these films and was able to program them on the Z channel. And it sort of built a big following. I just think that he, in a sense, had blinders on in which all he could see through his blinders uh, was film. And you grew up where? I grew up in Bakersfield. How would you describe Bakersfield? And how many words? <laughs> kind of a cross between American Graffiti and Tulane Blacktop. And was it, did you have an enjoyable childhood? No. You know, when Jerry came aboard, it was also the moment when HBO, Showtime, and the Movie Channel all showed up in L.A. He was a formidable competitor, and he didn't he didn't uh, say nice things about people he was competing against because he, he he lived and slept this job. They thought they were going to carve up the, the territory that belonged to uh, Z Channel. Z Channel was the only one in town at that time. Well, all the others thought, well, we're going to roll over this guy. And in fact, you know, a lot of people had told Jerry to his face, well, you know, it's, it, you run a nice little channel, it's too bad, you know. And he said, well, we'll see. And what happened was, of course, that HBO and those guys really couldn't get a toehold. Z Channel had what was called a zero churn rate, which means that nobody would cancel the service. 
Jerry loved Z Channel, he loved everything it was about, but he felt a lot of pressure to perform. He would call you in the middle of the night, on a Saturday night, on a Sunday morning at seven o'clock in the morning, he would call you and say, you gotta get me this. You know, there. You know, the channel will go under. It was always the sky is falling if you don't get me this. I gotta get this. So he tried to take it all on, and what he would always do to compensate in those kind of situations is that he would self-medicate. So he would go around with, um, he'd drink, and then he'd have no dose in his pocket. He was he was manic, but he was he was an obsessive programmer. I want to say that that's not a bad thing, by the way. Basically, he would come back from work at Z Channel and order pizza and fall asleep on the floor because he was taking a lot of medication. So he wasn't really functioning at home, but nobody knew it at work because he would function in the morning. I met Jerry on the telephone. He called me in London, woke me up 2.30 in the morning because he got all the times wrong. His first words to me were, how come I don't know you? So I get this lunatic on the phone at 2.30 in the morning giving me this, this, this long monologue about what other films have I made? He wants to see everything. Can I send everything over to him? What documentaries have I made and all that? Will you have a dance with me, please? I don't mind if I do. In the case of Overlord, you have a World War II film which actually incorporates footage from World War II, but incorporates it so artfully that you can't tell the stage footage from the, from the actual footage. We began a process of developing a screenplay based on real material, both documented material and footage. And I began to construct a dramatized documentary about a young English soldier. said, we'll start by having a month of Stuart Cooper. We'll show all the features. We'll do the documentaries later. We'll show all your, all your feature work during the month, different times. But the deal is you have to come a month ahead and do one-on-one -on -one screenings with the four or five key critics and have lunch with them or dinner and talk about the work. Gary Prebula called me up, said they're showing two films by Stuart Cooper, who I'd never heard of. He said, nobody's ever heard of him. Z Channel is going to premiere them. I said, there's still a Z channel? He said, oh yeah. I was debating whether or not to go. When I got there, I was glad I showed up because I was the only one there that I knew of. There was this other guy named Jerry Harvey who I didn't know, who I thought might be a fellow critic. I was fascinated by this guy, Stuart Cooper, because I had just seen Overlord for the first time. I was blown away by it. But I'm sitting there with Jerry, and Jerry is the one who's like talking to me in this mild way, and, and I'm getting along with him, and we're, we're, I mean, we were laughing at each other's jokes. It was really a great, um kismet moment because then he started doing some reviews for Z Channel for Jerry. It coincided with the period that my mother was dying. I got the news of my mother's death and within a half an hour the phone rings and it's Jerry Harvey. He's like the first call I'm getting. I don't know how he found out but uh, he called me and he was consoling me. He said, look, you know, I've been through, I've been through several deaths in my family and look, you, you, you can make it. You don't, it doesn't have to kill you. You know, and I said, uh, I, I, it won't kill me. I'm, I was like feeling super strong. I was not hearing what he was saying. Now it's like unbearably poignant. And that was the, the beginning of their relationship. And to the day Jerry died, I mean, FX and he were, were very close. When Jerry brought me aboard, my concern was as a critic, I didn't want to be paid to say, you know, good things about a movie I hated, you know. And Jerry liked my style of reviewing because I wouldn't so much punish the movie for not succeeding. I, I would come from a place of, well, I tried to like it. If I read Z Magazine religiously, I used to write nasty letters to FX Feeney. I used to get the angriest letters. And the angriest letters of my life I got from Z Channel subscribers. Yes, I think I did write letters to the Z Mag, which I had forgotten until contacted to uh, participate in this documentary. Um, I wrote, uh, I think, complaining about the the letterboxing bars weren't big enough for Kurosawa's high and low, and that's how I got this t-shirt. I remember I couldn't wait when my Z Channel magazine would come every month because I wanted to read all the reviews, which weren't always good. The people that wrote it knew that their audience was keenly interested in what they had to say. And what they had to say was a whole series of original 
and highly controversial observations about the films that were being shown. It wasn't the usual pap that you get in, in fan magazines. My belief, and I know that this is Jerry's belief too, is that if you appeal to the most intelligent member of the audience, everybody else follows along. There's this feeling that you have to appeal to the common denominator. Jerry and I hit on the phrase, the uncommon denominator. That's what we want, you know, because we want to go for the, the smart folks because everybody is smart. <laughs> Shit, that's my man! That's my man! <laughs> I don't think we'll make it past the cops. We'll make it past the cops. I just hope we don't see no Muslims. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, you owe Ben Angeli $4,000. You tell Ben Angeloli to suck my cock. Now, wait a minute. You lost that money. You should pay your debts. A double suck. The first couple of years of Jerry's stewardship of Z are marked by just uh, the ability to, to do the unexpected. So he was able to make simple but effective use of his position there. And suddenly his reputation started to take care of itself. I have this fantasy that, you know, in the year 2050 or the year 2075, they're going to read about the, the Fuhrer that, that attacked Heaven's Gate, you know, the, the, the Fuhrer that came down upon Heaven's Gate. And they're not going to believe it. It's going to seem like science fiction. <laughs> Stock Growers Association has the names of some of you people on the list. A hundred and twenty-five names. The then current UA management decided to make the film at a budget of twelve million. The twelve million turned out to be forty before they were through. The picture was a commercial disaster. Jerry would get very heated about what had happened to a movie, what had happened to a director, or how a film had kind of gotten off track, or how somebody had been slighted when they shouldn't have been slighted, you know, or, or beaten up when they shouldn't have been beaten up. Heaven's Gate was not only clobbered, it was basically burned at the stake. I mean, the critics ganged up on it, it became this huge set of headlines. It was in every paper. The Herald Examiner ran a story about it every day for three months. Every day. I was depressed for a year after that movie. I was depressed about it. I mean, really, it was just... I mean, uh, you do a do work and you think it's good and then nobody likes it, you know, no critics like it. And it goes down on the lane after two weeks, they pull it off of the theaters and it disappears. I mean, it was just... It was cut immediately and lay there until such time as Jerry approached Cimino and talked about reconstructing his long version. Without Jerry's prompting, it would never have occurred to me to try to find an intact print of the original Heaven's Gate. It was his question that set the whole process in motion. It became a four-hour special. We had the first screening of Heaven's Gate, I mean, which was really an event, and everybody tuned into it. They wanted to know what all the fuss was about. And in a different atmosphere, a different cultural climate, the reassembled Heaven's Gate got marvelous reviews. It was a big event, and it was the beginning of sort of big events happening on cable. It was really the first time anything like that had happened. You got to see the director's vision of what the movie was, even after the fact. It's very hard to get out, but in some ways, that, that put him 20 years ahead of his time. Had a great relationship with Michael Cimino because of that, because he really gave life to a film that had been so unfairly, whether in the end you liked the movie or not, it had been so unfairly treated. The 
effort to do something like that was a gargantuan effort. It'd be like saving a great edifice that was you know, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright or something. Jerry took great risks in the films that he bought. And that's why he was so respected. You know, it suddenly he had this position where he was being interviewed and quoted, and it was nice because he had this little, you know, this moment of feeling like people were acknowledging him for what, what he wanted to be acknowledged for. He would have liked to, I think, be making movies. Instead, he had such great respect for, for great filmmakers that he provided a place to showcase his, their works. I remember walking behind him one day as we were just taking a break. I'd turned in a bunch of stuff and he'd just made a bunch of buys and, you know, just done a bunch of business and he wanted to go out and get some ice cream. So, you know, we file out of this little garden spot office that we had, which is the first office that I knew, and we're, we're hiking up along Bundy, you know, and I'm walking behind him. It's just this very hot California day. He's wearing a tweed jacket. He's got that cigarette lighter around his neck and he's just bopping along. I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm walking behind him and I'm thinking, you know, We've just come off of several months of really happy work, and I'm thinking this is actually one of the happiest times of my life. What were your mother and father doing when you were growing up? My father was a judge. My mother was a personnel director for a hospital. Were you able to see your parents very often? They sound as though they were very busy people. Yeah, they were around. Maybe, maybe too much. <laughs> I was at Select TV, and Jerry called um, and said that he would like to talk to me. Would I be interested? And would I meet him for dinner to discuss uh, working at the Z Channel? We, we talked about what the duties would entail. And, and most of all, he talked about his personality. And he, sa he said to me, I'm crazy, you know. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Jerry would be very honest with you about his own needs. He would say, I gotta go to my shrink, you know? And he, he would just say it in that plain way, like, gotta go see my doctor, got a doctor's appointment. But it would happen to be a shrink's appointment. And he would go often, you know? I mean, you knew that he was devoting maybe a couple of afternoons a week to going over there. One day, everything would be fine. We'd be having a conversation. Maybe he'd go to the bathroom or go get a glass of water. And he'd come back and he would be incredibly depressed because he had looked at the corner of the room and realized that the workmanship was shoddy and start getting depressed about how n people don't care about anything anymore. And somehow in those moments that he would have had that revelation, it would sink him into this depression about how the planet was doomed and nobody gave a shit about anything anymore. And he said, in a very serious, intense way, I'm really crazy. I'm paranoid. He wrote letters to me at the time talking about what eventually would happen to him, that, that one day he would lose the struggle. Not in a threatening way, not in a, but he talked about it. In, in rare moments of lucidity, what frightened him was something inside of him that he didn't know how to deal with. I don't know how I got around the I'm crazy or and I'm paranoid line, but uh, I went to work there and found that to be pretty true. Black flag. <laughs> I, I made the movie. Um, the guys that paid for it were a couple of independent um, um, businessmen from the Valley who wanted to make a porno movie. And um, I went in to talk to them, and they didn't know I was going to come in and pitch a punk rock movie, but I told them that punk rock was the next best thing to porno. So, hey, let's sign a check, you know? And they did. <laughs> We showed the film one night, midnight, they had to shut down Hollywood Boulevard. And 300 motorcycle cops came. We had a letter from afterwards from Daryl Gates, the chief of police, saying, please don't ever show that movie in Los Angeles again. When I go to concerts, it's like my friends get beat up on my friends, you know? Then it's like fucked, you know? It's just cause like they're not beating up the right people. They're not beating up the fucking posers. They're beating up just, like, just my friends, it's fucked, you know. The cops recognized Eugene from having been in the decline and arrested him. <laughs> because they saw it on Z. Yeah, because they saw it on the Z channel, yeah.
you a little longer than I thought. I'm afraid it's going to take a little longer than that. I'm leaving now. Roads wet. It wasn't raining when I got here. No. Too bad. People really did not understand that film. They didn't get it, you know, and and the critics didn't get it. I was up for an audition to go do um, Star Wars, of all things. And um, so I was reading Star Wars, and my agent was like push pressuring me, you know, like, go read for Star Wars. We, you know, this is going to be this thing. And I'm going, I don't know. And I'd always said as in my little actress prayer, if anybody just gave me the chance, I could just show them. I know it. I could please, God, give me this chance. And then bad timing went up, <laughs> fell in my lap, and I was like, Holy <laughs> can I do this, you know? Alex. You want me? Huh? Huh? Come on. Come on. Do it now, Alex. Do it now. Here it is, Alex. Here it is. Look at it, Alex. Alex, that's what you wanted, huh? There it is, Alex. Come here. Come here. Come here. Take it. That's what you want. Here it is. Come on. In terms of the Z Channel showing it so much, I mean, it, because it was had such a small release uh, theatrically, I mean, in, especially in this country, that was really where everybody had a chance to see it. And I mean, I, I, I swear, even to this day, I'll have people come up to me and tell me how much that that movie affected them. How did you go about finding those films? Because, I mean, obviously it took some effort and no one else was doing it. You look at a lot of a lot of things that you think might be interesting based on somebody, not everybody that was involved in it, or 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 what it's about, or what it's based on, or where it was filmed, or you know, there's a million reasons. But just like anything you like, you say, "Gee, that sounds interesting." HBO, Showtime, the Movie Channel. All of us are at this big convention in some hotel, big table, dais, pictures of water, nameplates. Jerry's down at the other end, and everybody's like going down the list, talking about how many committees they've got, how many market research. We hire this firm from New York. We've got this firm from Chicago, bah, 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 bah. Uh, Jerry, how, do, what, how many firms do you draw on to, you know, choose your program? He says, I don't consult anybody. I just, you know, I just see movies. I just show good movies. Yeah, but uh, your decision-making process, who's your committee? I don't have a committee, just me. I just, you know, I mean, we have people in the office. We talk, you know, we like movies, but, you know, basically it's just whatever we want to see. Je fais les poussières. Mon mari est au cinéma. Jerry was an early and passionate admirer of a film called The Important Thing is to Love, directed by Andrzej Zulawski. That film had a huge cult in Europe in the mid-70s. I would sometimes, seeing European films, see clips from it because other European directors were so in awe of The Important Thing is to Love that they would run little clips in their movies. Lovers in, in French films would often be going to see The Important Thing is to Love. It became this immediate touchstone that automatically was being quoted in other films. C'est tout ce que je peux faire pour toi. But it only opened briefly. It only opened for a week. And, and it just was misunderstood by the first critics who dealt with it. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't form the cult that it could have here in the United States. Mon manteau, monsieur. Vous l'avez touché. Et alors? Et alors? Il m'a coûté très cher ce manteau. Et comme je suis, par exemple, un homosexuel de bonne famille, je tiens énormément à mes affaires. Voyons, calme. Silence. I mean, the thing about the Z Channel is that the sensibility was uh, uh, offbeat and a, a little bit, um, I don't know, I mean, they showed everything. It was really appropriate that it was in L.A. in a way, because in New York we did have a lot of like uh, venues to find those kind of movies. When I started working at um, this video store in Manhattan Beach called Video Archives, and um, the guy who owned the store, Lance uh, Lawson, 
I would ask, hey, do you have this movie? Do you have that movie? And he'd pull them out. And as I'd watch them, I'd realize that these were the old Z Channel tapes. And I still have um, probably hundreds of hours of films that I recorded off the Z Channel. I saw Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street from Z Channel. I had a whole, and, and, and uh, he just lent me the film. And then I watch it, and then it just uh, makes me go like this, because the beginning of it, you know, our tribute to Sam Fuller, all right? And then. And you see all the other movies that, like, they also show, but Lance only taped Dead Pigeon, all right? Like, oh, damn, I want to see Vicks Bayonets. <laughs> Park Row, god damn it! <laughs> Tape Park fucking Row! In those days, that was the only game in town, you know? I mean, there's the only cable channel where you can watch real good movies, you know, which totally disappeared from the screen, you know? and. Uh, you know, and, and some of them were my movies, and uh, of course, I always like to see my movies just to see how it works on television, you know. When uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller came, first came out, it was a flop. It made less money, grossed less money, I think, than O.C. and Stiggs, or some of these films in mine, they were really flops. And it's become a little, kind of a mini classic. You do a film and it's so, uh, it's just different from what the standard thing is. They just don't succeed until the audiences have time to let themselves catch up with it. It's hard to keep the audience's attention when you show them everything. And the problem with most films is, is it you hear it, you see exactly what it is. If you're talking, there's a big close-up of your face, so we know that you're talking, and we hear it. So I think the, the mandate in film is to hide that, to make the audience, oh, what's, what's going on? I don't quite see that. Uh, oh, you think that's... So, so that the, the, the goosebumps can come out. Otherwise, you know, you're sitting there drinking Coca-Cola and uh, eating a hot dog. You chose your journey long before you came upon this island. I knew Jerry personally so well. He would say, hey, I'm gonna sneak your film on my channel. And I said, oh, that's good. But, because otherwise they didn't play anywhere. I mean, they, they just didn't play anywhere. The Z Channel did great film festivals. We'd put on Truffaut film festivals and Kurosawa film festivals and Australian film festivals, French film festivals, English film festivals, anything that we could sort of highlight maybe a lesser known movie around. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about Z Channel was like uh, investigating somebody's work. Jacqueline Bisset seemed like a fetish in a way, which I thought was pretty cool. Jacqueline Bisset is so much a figure of Z Channel, I think because her great beauty a great beauty lent itself to Day for Night by Truffaut. It lent itself to a wonderful film called Les Magnifiques, which was the quintessential Z movie. That is to say, a European movie that few people knew about stateside, but which had a great deal of American-style entertainment value built into it. You got Jean-Paul Belmondo as a, a, a poor writer who's fantasizing himself the, the superhero of, of, of his own pulp novel. And the girl downstairs, you know, Jackie Bissett, is, is like the, the iconic star of this pulp novel in this guy's head. I'm not going to lie, I'm No, it's for you, don't you? When I did Le Magnifique, uh, Philip de Broca 
asked me to play this part, which was one part was a student and one part was this sort of Bond-type character. Et pour vous, mon enfant, tu mets saké, toqué, alcool de goyave, papaye fermentée, une lame de saké. Non. Je vais te faire l'amour, petite fille. Doing Le Magnifique was interesting, but it was a lot to do, interesting for me, to, was to watch Jean-Paul Belmondo, because he was the most coordinated actor I've ever worked with. And he could do three or four things, comb his hair, machine gun somebody, jump from rock to rock, like a light-footed leper, you know, just, uh, not a leper, um, leopard. <laughs> God. And like a person of, like an animal, like a beautiful animal. It's like having a film festival in your house every single night. A film festival that you, that you would, you know, you wouldn't have to go to Rotterdam and you wouldn't have to go to Berlin and you wouldn't have to go to Cannes and you wouldn't have to go to Venice. It was just like you, your own private film festival. And the programming was eccentric and odd and mixed. I was angry at it many times. I thought, why are you playing that? You've got some, you're the only voice on television. Play only the kind of art films that I like, you know? But it, it was very good in not catering just to me. It, it really gave you a kind of smorgasbord. It gave you a kind of open-ended view of all kinds of cinema. And it gave you a sense of the size and scope that cinema has. Antonioni is not necessarily about the logical structure of a dramatic story, but about uh, atmosphere and nuance and the kind of emotional tension that exists more like weather. One of the most striking things for me in my memory is uh, Monica Vitti walking across a piazza, and then you see above, like about 25 guys just watching her move, you know? And it says so much about Italian culture, about visual imagery, about femininity, about sex, about, you know, he, the just being a human and, and then being in a place, in a, like, kind of classical piazza, somewhere very, you know, very Italian and Mediterranean. I don't know, it's just kind of haunting. Jean Moreau, walking down the street in La Notte, did it for me. I said, this is a woman, this is a job. Whatever this woman's doing, I have no idea why she's so depressed. <laughs> she's obviously totally depressed, and this man is not treating her well. I don't care about him. She is fascinating. I don't know what that, all that means. It was just unknown material. For someone to sit and think, okay, I want to show the final break in a relationship. I want to see that actual the crack. Now how? What about they attend an all-night party and somehow it's the attending of that party that makes, that fi makes them finally realize that the relationship is dead. And that's the film you set out to write. Stare attaccati a qualche cosa di certo. Io ti amo. Ecco. Io sono convinto di amarti ancora. Cosa vuoi che ti dica? Torniamo a casa. Have you ever been married? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think so. By the fall of 1983, it was really clear to me that I couldn't stay in this relationship anymore. The psychiatry that I'd had so much hope for wasn't going to solve the problem. Jerry wasn't ready to solve the problem, or perhaps capable, but I didn't care anymore. I went into work one day, and Jerry wasn't there. And 
he was gone, as it would prove, for three weeks. I'd understood that it was a contract dispute and he was holding a firm line. Well, he surfaced three weeks later, and in that time he had, he had divorced Vera. He continued to um, be in touch with me. We saw one another a few times, um, a couple of times when they were really ill-fated because I'm, you know, we sort of had a little moment together and then that would just make it worse because it would give him hope. Jerry, you know, spoke bitterly of that period. Um, not bitterly of Vera, but just of, you know, being married and being in that zone and, and it was just somehow, that was something we didn't discuss except to acknowledge that love was hell. In that three weeks in which he had disappeared from the face of the earth, he had dissolved his marriage to Vera and started dating the landlady at his new apartment. It was Derry Rudolph, who I eventually met in a couple months later. Jerry Harvey loved a movie that Henry Fonda did with his ex-wife, Margaret Sullivan. It was called The Moon's Our Home. And it was basically a New Year's Eve picture. And Jerry wanted to play it as his New Year's Eve movie one year. Very hard to get a hold of. Do you, Sarah Brown, I take John Smith to be the wedding husband? I suppose you want me to wait around doing nothing while you're making up your mind. I certainly do. To have and to hold from this day forth, well, that's the way you feel about it. You want to call the whole thing off? I certainly do. Do you promise to love, honor, and obey him? You really mean that? I most apartment? certainly do. And just the piece of moon I'm sunk sick of being made a fool of. I'm through. In New Hampshire. I never want to I see you again as long as I live. Man I wouldn't marry you if you Now all you got to do is kiss the bride, and it's three dollars. It was a favorite picture of his, and the audience got to see it. I, I can see that uh, you're definitely in love with films. I mean, you well, certainly it's your life, but it seems to be totally your life. Do you do anything outside of film, for instance? What do you mean? <laughs> Jerry was a creature of habit, and he had his watering holes, and I think the favorite of all his watering holes was Guido's. And he very often went there with Michael Cimino. When I was introduced to Cimino for the first time, it was at Guido's. Jerry knew all the waiters, they all knew Jerry. The waiters all knew Cimino. In fact, when Cimino walked through the door, two waiters at once reached out with cigarette letters. I remember going to Guido's one afternoon for, it was kind of a late, late, uh, late lunch. And Jerry was there and pretty wound up. And I, I remember, the thing I remember the most about him is he was perspiring, kind of profusely, in the restaurant. And he was, wound, I can't remember exactly what he was wound up about, but he was wound up about something. Uh, it was something was going on or something was bothering him, but um, we had a few drinks. And I remember the, the waiter or one of the guys came around and adjusted his neck for him right there at the restaurant, kind of got behind him and said, Jerry, you're, you're, way, you're way overstressed here, and kind of did a you know, cracked his neck like, oh my God, you know. He was a really moody guy. The days that he would walk into his office, uh, you know, sort of skulk into his office and shut the door, we knew not to approach him. I know he fought with his demons an awful lot, you know. At the same time, those demons were kind of which drove him on um, because he was insistent and persistent and uh, he refused to take no for an answer and he was constantly trying to, uh, to make things right. I remember when Jerry brought uh, 1900 Lucci's film, and played the entire film, not cut. And it was so exciting. I got the six hour uh, 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 1900, all right, from Lance when he taped it off of uh, uh, Z Channel. I still have, because it took me two uh, 120 tapes, I still have the full 1900 recorded off of Z. <laughs> Nineteen hundred was a very jinxed film, you know, in the in the sense that Bertolucci had spent too much money on it. The Grimaldis were unhappy with him for spending too much money on it, and so his version was under lock and key for many years, almost in a fit of pique. Jerry insisted to the Grimaldis for five years that they had an uncut 1900, you know, a five-hour version of 1900 that existed. No, no, it no longer exists. Maybe it existed once, but it no longer exists. And he pressed them and pressed them and eventually managed to get it released. And so we showed it on Z Channel. And there you could see in all its splendor what Bertolucci had intended.
It's another amazing thing about the Z Channel to me. Like, I don't even know how you could get the rights to show these things, but, you know, with all those politics involved. But to, to just have access to the, the vision of the director is amazing, you know, invaluable. You just never know when you're living in a golden age. I saw uh, Berlin uh, Alexanderplatz. Now, that was the most extraordinary <laughs> revelation. Where else are you going to see this 12 or 14 hours of this magnificent novel turned into this extraordinarily brilliant film, which nobody in, a, in, in commercial filmmaking to this day will ever put on television. It was like some enormous meal that kept coming, you know, and you saw the whole thing. It was, it was breathtaking. Wenn ich sage, das ist Abwaschwasser, Frenze, dann ist das Abwaschwasser und kein Kaffee. Verstanden? Und ich sage, dass es Kaffee ist und kein Abwaschwasser. Wir haben einmal jeden Gast, Frenze. Und da stellst du Abwaschwasser auf den Tisch. One day, he walked into the office and said, come into my office, please. And I went into his office, and he said, he sat back in his chair, and he said, I don't like the air that you breathe. I don't like the ground that you walk on. I can't stand to be in the same room as you are. You are a horse unreined. And I looked at him, and I was completely flabbergasted and shocked. I mean, I, I think I even laughed because it was so out of nowhere. And, and, uh, and I remember laughing, I remember at one point laughing and saying, well, I guess there's no room for me to grow in this organization. And, uh, and he told me he'd write a letter of recommendation or something. The day Peckinpah died, Jerry had to leave work early. You know, Jerry got the phone call that Peckinpah had died, and uh, someone who knew Jerry well just came over to the office and took him out for the rest of the day. It was just understood that that was just going to be something Jerry couldn't work past for a bit. It was like family, you know, Sam, Sam and Jerry, and um, Jerry had a very strong sense of, of, uh, of, of family, and that um, you don't see that much anymore. He really. If you felt that you were part of th this undefinable idea of, of a family, um, you didn't have to, you could you could turn your back and he'd cover it. We were all uh, quite devastated over Sam passing and the fact that he wasn't able to get work. Well, there was nobody nobody in this town that would finance him at all for anything. He went, I think the last thing he did was a. Julian Lennon video. Well, Peckinpah's recent years had been so difficult that, you know, one could see, one could sense that he was moving toward that one way or another. Yeah, yeah. As a receptionist, I was literally sitting right outside Jerry's door. So I quietly sat there and occasionally would bring up some film talk with him. And he began to realize that I knew a little bit about film. Then he brought me into the programming department. And usually I had Tim Ryerson in with him, and they'd be, they'd be like two guys bailing hay on an intellectual level. It'd just be, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Bing, bong, bing. And they'd be moving their way down the board, trying, trying ideas out on each other. You stood at that board and, and moved those magnetic stripes around that represented the different films. Uh, I can remember many times just it was like standing there and looking at it, and it was just dreaming about all the wonderful possibilities that you could do.
Claude Chabrol. In fact, that was one of the other directors, all right, that Lance gave me, I'd never seen This Man Must Die, all right? And they showed it on Z Channel and I got it from him. You still can't see that goddamn movie. It was the great thing about Z right from the get-go that they were running European films. That was how they got the reputation, that they programmed them well and they were making a hit with it. Who knew? <laughs> One interesting aspect of Das Boot, you know, it had, it had a career as a film in theaters where it really wowed audiences around the country. But then we discovered that it had been a miniseries in Germany, that it was actually six hours long and that there were six hour long episodes. Makes sense. We showed it. Watch out! Check periscope alignment. I'm in the engine room. Rim calculations check, sir. Zero, six, zero. Check. What's going on? Look out! Is this... Tragic irony under Das Boot that these guys who are just hardworking guys who don't think politically, who just love the sea and are under it and in it and involved with their work and whose reality is one another. They have no idea that they're in a sense like the Monty Python character is about to be crushed by a big foot from the sky. And in a way, it's because it's played in slow motion, we can feel the tragic melancholy behind that. HBO was a thorn in the side of everyone who worked at Z Channel because they feared that HBO would muscle them off the dial. HBO had buying power so they could give monies to studios which were very alluring. Z Channel had budgets that, uh, that restricted on, and you couldn't just pay for everything that you really wanted to do. There was always somebody saying to him, do we have to spend money on this program guide? Gee, if we didn't have the program guide, then we could be more profitable. Do you have to spend so much money on the movies? Do we have to spend so much in marketing the Z Channel? There were all these pressures on him. Sometimes they would take money away from him that he couldn't spend next year. He had to figure out what his limitations were, and Jerry was very good about doing that. He had a very strong business sense, so he knew what he could do and what he couldn't do. But he realized that what he could do was a lot based on simply his own knowledge of movies. Not only did, did, did Jerry champion the, the uh, full version of Heaven's Gate, but he also uh, felt the same way about uh, Leone's uh, Once Upon a Time in America. Because you still think like some schmuck from the streets. Now, if we listened to you, we'd still be rolling drunks for a living. Who's a very mad day? You broke? Don't bust my balls, noodles. I am talking about real money. This is real money to me. It's a lot of money. You want any of it? You'll carry that stink of the streets with you the rest of your life. Well, when we did Once Upon a Time in America, it was clearly, from a personal point of view, an extraordinary opportunity. I mean, this was, you know, one of the, potentially one of the greatest movies, one of the great epics ever made. I mean, it was, you know, Bob De Niro was at the height of his career. I mean, he still is. He's always great. But, I mean, he had just come off Raging Bull and... You know, Sergio Leone was a genius. It was a 12-year project for him. We shot for 11 months. And because of one test screening, Warner Brothers and the Lad Company decided to take the three hour and 43 minute version of Once Upon a Time in America and cut it down to two hours and something. And they used the assistant editor of Police Academy 2 or something to cut it. It broke the director's heart. It was cut by a group of people who should never have been allowed in the cutting room. Um, and they, they massacred it. They ruined it. They made a test showing of it in Chicago or Illinois, something on a cold night. They didn't get the results they wanted. Any problem? No trouble. Kid stuff. Yeah, it was a really grueling, miserable experience, but I was really 
It was hugely frustrating and disappointing, discouraging. The full version was, was a masterpiece as compared to like a routine film in a, in a butchered, shortened version. Come here. Look at this. Come here. Sudden death. Fucking tragedy, huh? 26 years old. 26? The Stugadar. What a shame. Great stiff. She died of an overdose. And I'm ready for another. <laughs> Jerry actually showed both versions side by side on the Z channel. And I mean, there was no doubt. <laughs> no doubt how stunning it is to allow your creation when you're an artist to be manhandled by other people who are maybe not as adept at, at, the, at understanding the vision as you, the filmmaker, is. He's a real friend. He's a romantic. When it came out in its aborted version, Sheila Benson, who was then also a critic for the Times, called it the worst movie of the year, and then it was restored to the director's cut, which was also shown, and eight years later, she picked it as either the best or one of the five or 10 best pictures of the decade, which goes to show you what a little editing can do. What Z Channel was and what Jerry did is it became an alternative voice, a voice which said, not only you're wrong, but here's why you're wrong. Here's how it should play, and here's how they played it. And then they shut up because a picture's worth a million words. And do you feel you've arrived where you are by accident or by design? Initially by accident, and then by, and then subsequently by design. Derry was so warm. She was so bright, and uh, I met her at her house. She had a party for Jerry at her house, and that was it. in itself was a very welcoming gesture. It was a a birthday party at the end of 1985. She is a lovely woman, both in spirit and in physical beauty, actually. And I immediately felt glad that if Jerry had to leave Vera for anybody, that at least he'd found his way to Derry because she seemed to be such a positive spirit. Derry grew up with a mother who had been in an iron lung and, and needed an awful lot from Derry. As I recall, her mother had been in a wheelchair a lot. So Derry grew up taking care of people. And that's what she tried to do with Jerry. To know her was to just, you know, have a crush on her. She was just so amazing. And she was becoming a stand-up comedian. She was starting a newspaper in Westwood. She owned a lot of property in Westwood. She'd inherited a lot of property. And she felt a great loyalty to the community. She's a very optimistic, open, outgoing person. And wanted sincerely to support Jerry and give him what he needed emotionally. Are there any points in your life where you can look back and see that you might have done something else at that particular point? Mm-hmm. Many, many times. Really? Yeah. yeah. There, I think there are myriads of crossroads in one's life where one stops and says, do I go this way or do I go that way? I was very happy when I'd heard that he had remarried. You know, I thought, well, if, since it finally didn't work out with Vera after you know, a substantial number of years together, I thought, well, this is nice that he's met somebody else, you know. Their marriage was a very colorful affair held at the Westwood Marquis, and Jerry, in his contribution to the ceremony was to add lines from Ride the High Country. You know, he had the, the minister say, I am not a man of a cloth. And this is not a religious ceremony. It's a civil marriage. But it's not to be entered into unadvisedly, but reverently, and soberly. A good marriage has a kind of a simple glory about it. A good marriage is, is like a rare animal. It's hard to find. It's almost impossible to keep. 
You see, people change. And that's important for you to know at the beginning. People change. It was a, an occasion at which, you know, Jerry's circle of friends was small but very potent and in attendance. There was me. Michael Cimino was best man at the wedding. Um, and let's see, there was James B. Harris. There were a whole group of really terrific people there. And Derry's very large family, they all were in love with Derry, you know, and who wouldn't be? I mean, it was just a, a really terrific gathering. The market had been created after Heaven's Gate for director's cuts, and The Leopard had been in a botched cut. Even the studio knew to be a botched cut. And so The Leopard was restored to its full strength with an eye toward the video market. And Jerry was there the night they screened it for the first time, and he made sure there was an offer on the table and that when we showed it on Z Channel, we highlighted it. I have seen the, the, uh, uh, the uncut version of it, all right? Uh, and they restored it to more or less its IB Technicolor stature. Oh, it's fantastic. The Leopard is about one night in the life of a Sicilian prince. And this prince may be dying. There's a feeling of mortality that's plaguing him. You know, he's got a bad heart, it seems, and he's just sort of moving through the chambers of his life in a kind of melancholy way. But really what's happening is that an era is ending around him. Because of the length that Visconti gave to that, story, that prince, in, in his, this single night of his life, we actually feel the world moving through this man. And we feel that, you know, when he goes, a world goes with him. I met Jerry in 1986 or 87. I was working at a video store in Westwood called Videotech, and uh, I was uh, going to college here at UCLA, and I was a clerk there, and Jerry was one of the many industry uh, customers who used to come in. He made me a bit uncomfortable. He just seemed very strange, very uh, just, he gave off an uncomfortable vibe. Uh, his wife, on the other hand, was a sweet, charming woman, and she gave off a great vibe. Jerry would go in there and rent videos, and they would get into conversations, and, and Jerry realized, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. And he asked me if, I was, uh, if I'd be interested in working at Z as a, as a programming assistant, and at that point, my uh, attitude changed greatly. <laughs> I was very happy to see him. I think one reason Jerry was such a great programmer. It was the knowledge and the taste, the showmanship, the creativity, and then the passion to do it, or the commitment to do it. HBO and Showtime each launched a second channel that was uh, more movie focused, more film buff focused. Uh, Showtime did the movie channel, HBO did Cinemax, and uh, you know, they certainly were aware of Z Channel and, and, and tried to steal some of our thunder. We didn't think they were doing a very good job of it. I mean, if we ran it, even, even certain foreign films would, would end up running on, on the other places. They would have to be pretty sexy, usually. Our Night Owl films tended to show up a lot on Movie Channel and Showtime and, and HBO, just because it's like, well, tits and ass. Ulisse dice che è stanco, ma non ha sonno. Capisci? Teniamogli compagnia. Huh? Much to my surprise, when I asked Jerry what was the most successful aspect of our programming, he said, the Night Owl series. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no, we're killing Nightline. We're killing the 11 o'clock news. Night Owl programs were our uh, late night kind of soft core uh, things, uh, movies with sex, TNA, uh, stuff like that. My objectivity breaks right the fuck down when I think of those Night Owl films because those girls, the women in those films were so pretty. I mean, they always found, you know, even in the lamest of the Night Owls, you know, even in the one that has like no plot or it's just like, how, why am I watching this? I know I'm only watching this till the next nude scene, but I'm going to stay in there, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the lady on the bus, I remember.
someone like Laura Antonelli or Sonia Braga would hit it big with a respectable film, but their backlog was full of all kinds of early nudie kind of films, and and we would get them all. So basically, we would have you know Laura Antonelli festivals that had every last movie she'd made, you know, with all the nude scenes. Laura Antonelli is like, whatever happened to her? I think she was like the first actress that I ever like fell in love with in a movie that I went to like see her films and they were genuinely sexy. I mean, I don't think I knew what sexy was before then. I had crushes on actresses and I was like, thought I was in love with them, all right? Uh, but I'm watching Life Mistress. There's a scene and she's with the, this actor, he's trying to get her to room, his room and they're making out on the stairs. And he reaches and grabs her in her crotch. And it was really sexy to see that. And when he did it, she went, oh! And she almost like collapsed in his arms. Please take me to bed, please. And then they didn't go into the room. And I was pissed. The great divergence between European cinema and American cinema really is about sex. If you want to do nudity in a movie, you have to do that in a certain way. That's, that is, or because it's, it, it's interesting because it's so natural, because you see things with, that people do with, with each other that you were not aware of that could be done. I've been, we get many, many calls after Turkish Delight, say we, uh, you enriched our sex life, so. Is dat echt? Ja, wat dacht je dan? Een pruik. Vroeger noemden ze me schemerlampje. Is de rest ook rood? Welke rest? Hier. Kijk zelf maar. P. Ja? P. Turks Delight, well, that was a great book, you know. I love the book. It was like, in, in, in Holland, was doing Gone with the Wind in the United States, you know. Everybody was interested and was having an opinion if it should be um, Vivian Lee or not, isn't it? And who should be uh, her lover, Clay Cable, or anybody else. And, and this was like, this is our book. It was so phenomenally important, that book in Holland at that time. I had worked with Rutger Hauer um, on a television series, which was called Flores. Because he was a, a television person, we di I didn't even think about him. Strangely enough, my producer, Rob Hauer, said, you know, well, what about this nice guy that you used in, in Flores, you know? And he has a nice hat and he seems sympathetic. Why don't you test him? I said, you know, he's more a farmer. He was like, bum, bum, bum. He was like that. And he said, yeah, but you never know. You have to test him. And, and so I tested everybody. And at the end, I tested Rutger Hauer, too. And then I realized that the Rutger Hauer was phenomenal, you know, that it was absolutely, I, that I couldn't have been more wrong in thinking that he couldn't do it. We cast it with Rutger Hauer. And that was, of course, for everybody that knew the book, was like, are you an idiot? You know, how can he do this wonderful character of, of Eric, he's called, that is so beautiful and has this, all these feelings with this woman. So I was right. <laughs> I was right. I've been right a couple of times. I've been wrong many times, you know. The fact that I immigrated to the United States in '85 had to do not only with the fact that I got um, that I got a job here, but um, but with the fact that people got me the job because they knew my work, and they knew it because of Z Channel. 
Is there anything else you would like to have done with your life than what you're doing at the moment? Oh, there's a million things. Be president, uh, run a major studio. Um, more than anything, though, I think I would like to have been able to play uh, professional football, throw passes, be a quarterback. A lot of things like that. Jerry felt excited about what he was doing. He'd be excited about a new deal. He'd be excited about being able to ex announce a Warner's deal or, or something along those lines. But at the same time, I always felt that Jerry felt beaten. He, 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 I think he felt he was fighting that uphill battle. The whole time or just later? I think the whole time. I always felt that way with Jerry. You know, when you were a friend of Jerry's, you were kind of immersed in his whole being, his whole life. Um, and that was, you know, that was quite a lot of stuff. When Derry suggested marriage, Jerry said, I've got to, I'll be honest with you, I don't want children. I mean, if you're okay with that, then we can, then we can talk, but you just need to know that before we, you get your hopes up. Jerry was so hurt by his family, it was difficult for him to get married. And when he did get married, initially inconceivable to have children so much so that he had had a vasectomy. He certainly did give me the outlines of a very, very dysfunctional family life, very tormented. His father was a judge who, at some point in his career, had sent more people to death in, in the county of whatever Bakersfield County is than any other judge. I mean, this was a family full of pain and darkness and strangeness. Jerry's father was a fundamentalist Catholic, someone who was so much a traditionalist, so hidebound, that, that uh, he, didn't even, he wasn't even close to his family. You know, when his own daughter was coming to him in a suicidal state, he slammed the door in her face. From what Jerry said, Jerry's father was a drunk, um, rather sadistic towards his kids. Uh, Jerry didn't really have a lot of nice things to say. Uh, would tell stories about uh, his father coming in and throwing water on him to wake him up in the morning. and. Uh, there were, there were no specifics of, of specific, specific references to specific abuse or anything else, but it was something he really didn't talk about that much. He expressed actually more active, active anger toward his mother. She was an extremely monotone person. Uh, I never saw her angry. I never saw her cry. I never saw her really laugh that much. It was like she was almost in a, in a drug state. Maybe she was shut off emotionally because she had done things and, and not been there for them or allowed abuse to happen to them. We'll never know. He told me that he had another sister. The, the family really did not know what had happened to, but had come to the feeling that she had committed suicide. Jerry never really made that big of a point about it, except that Mary had disappeared. And he kind of just said that as a, as a toss away line, and that's all he, he would refer to it. It's the only way he would refer to it. He had told me stories of struggling with depression and um, what, what he sort of identified as evil thoughts and dark thoughts when he was growing up. Jerry was always volatile. Uh, he always had a very bad temper. Uh, but he didn't drink until in the late 70s when he started drinking. When Jerry drank, he was dangerous. Um, I can remember once in Rome we were all having a great time, we were drinking, and I made the comment, God created whiskey to keep the Irish from ruling the world. And Jerry took a cigarette and flicked it right at my face from across the table, hit me in the eye. Unfortunately, I wear glasses. We both looked for him for a therapist and found this doctor that he went to that we were really excited about. He was smart, he was as smart as Jerry, he could challenge him, and it started out to be a really good thing, and Jerry really looked forward to it because he could talk to somebody. He found somebody that could really challenge him and talk to him. Unfortunately, along the way, it fell into other traps, and I don't think in the end it was a, such a good thing. 
I didn't live in fear. I, I mean, the day I was afraid, it was over. The day I got afraid and something happened to make me afraid, we weren't together anymore. I just had this really bad feeling. I tried to call the house because he should have been there and he didn't answer the phone and I just had a bad feeling so I got in my car and I drove back to the house. And I came in and he had taken a lot of pills and he was waving a gun that was the gun that Sam Peckinpah had given him. And I just went to look for his doctor's phone number because I just thought this is like something terrible is happening here. And when I came back, he held the gun on me. And basically, in one form or another, you know, had the gun at my head and in my mouth and, and up against my head for the next three or four hours. He had called the doctor before and left him a message that he was in trouble. So he had reached out already. The doctor had arranged to come and take him to the hospital. And it was basically from that moment we were never together. I didn't see Jerry for seven years while he was married to Vera. When Vera and Jerry started to break up, I guess I was the first phone call. And Jerry showed back up in my life and it was, it was like the thing I had dreamed of for all of those years. One night, um, we were having dinner somewhere in Westwood and I remember Jerry starting to get angry for no reason. I mean, it was, we were having a very um, pedestrian conversation about something and out of nowhere, he started to become infuriate, infuriated. So um, he got to the point where he, he stood up and he walked out of the restaurant. So I went trailing after him. And when I got up behind him, I remember grabbing him by the shirt going, and what's the matter? What did I say? What happened? And he turned around and all of a sudden I found like his fist was in the air and he was about to pummel me with it. And he looked up at his hand and, and, he, and he looked down at me and he looked up at his hand and he kind of caught it and he, and he pulled it back to himself. And it was as if it was somebody else's hand. Jerry and I, change the nature of our relationship after that. I think on some level he was trying to back off and protect me from being subjected to that. But the subtext to all of that also is that he had moved out from his place with Vera into another apartment and the landlady was Derry. What the fuck is this? Mace. Mace for what? Wild dogs. Yeah, wild well, dogs, that's bullshit, Boyle. You've lied to me straight through, haven't you? You want me to be honest with you? No. Salvador was not the kind of picture you would expect. It wasn't a studio picture. It didn't have any studio juggernaut behind it. There was no money to promote it. It showed for two weeks, as I said, in two theaters in February, 10 months ago. So it was forgotten. ¿Con quién andas? Comunista. Quítate los lentes. It was clear that both Jerry and, and Chuck Champlin thought, thought it was just a terrific picture and the kind of picture that should have gotten attention but didn't. Charles Champlin wrote a front page article in the LA Times that was a two page article about this great forgotten classic. And then Jerry Harvey called up and said, hey, that was great that Chuck did that. He said, I really believe in this film. And he said, I believe Z Channel can have an, a little bit of influence. He said, I'm gonna give this film a shot. He said, I'm gonna show it during December. So he said, while all the studios are screening their movies at every private screening room on the Bel what's called the Bel Air Beverly Hills circuit, and while they're showing them at theaters and so on, this film, which is not being shown anywhere, is going to be shown on the Z Channel. So there was the cover of Z Channel, which everybody in the business got, and everybody's now saw Salvador this month, right? And the next thing you know... Paul Newman in The Color of Money, James Woods in Salvador. I get nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor, and Oliver and Richard Boyle, who co-wrote the screenplay, 
got nominated for Best Screenplay. What's the most exciting thing for you about movie making? Um, tonight? <laughs> tonight is the most exciting thing about movie making, believe me. It was an amazing year, and had Jerry not sort of pushed to have Chuck do the interview at the right time, put Z Channel uh, magazine out with the Salvador picture on the cover, with the whole cover, uh, shown it during that month, that picture would have been completely forgotten, and the kind of work that I'm most proud of, just personally, would never have been seen. Are you kidding? So, you know, I think that, personally, I've always felt that that particular day with Chuck Champlin and with Jerry Harvey and, and what came of it was really the turning point in, in my career, without a doubt. HBO and the other competitors, you know, they had been wanting they had been wanting Z Channel gone for a long time. It was many people were taking bets on when Z Channel would finally slide off the cliff, and it was Jerry's tenacity and the stubborn reputation of Z Channel. The fact that it was really beloved in the community; those things worked together to keep Z kind of like floating, like a castle in the air beyond its normal mortality. Z Channel had a at its peak, I think, about 100,000 paying subscribers. There were others who I think were uh, stealing it. We had people calling up to say, uh, would it be possible to subscribe to the magazine without subscribing to the channel? You know, I was like, why would you like to do that? I remember we had some new owners come in. The CEO ordered Z Channel for his home. The cable man drove up to the home and said to the CEO's wife, not knowing who she was, give me 20 bucks or whatever, and I'll give you Z Channel for free. Jerry was very stressed at that time and unhappy at that time. And I, um, and I guess that's some, somewhere in there is where the, uh, the salute to Z we became a, uh, a, something we, we intended to do. The AFI tribute in January of 1987 was a real highlight in, I think, Jerry's life and I think in the life of Z Channel. We were about to be sold. This was a moment of marshalling the troops. Everybody who had benefited because of Z Channel's existence was invited to come take part in a day-long series of panels. One person that Jerry became very close to in the last couple of months of his life was film director Richard Brooks, who directed Elmer Gantry, In Cold Blood, Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Jerry located certain films of Richard Brooks's that had been forgotten, such as Something of Value with Rock Hudson and Sidney Poitier. When it comes time to kill the lion, I want to shoot the gun too. It's Jeff Shaw, and you know how he feels about Africans and guns. I want to shoot the gun, too. I'm sorry. Lathela. Always when we hunt, it is the same. You have all the fun. I do all the work. But when we were little and played together. But we're big now. And things are not the same. Get him. Hit him. Hit him hard. Do what he says. Now, and in a hurry. Something of Value is a movie from the early 50s which deals with apartheid. It deals with the Mau Mau uprisings of the 1950s in Africa, which is a topic so relevant to contemporary history. It was, it, it was painfully relevant to the situation that was in South Africa uh, at the, in the late 1980s. You know, Nelson Mandela was still in prison when we played Something of Value on Z Channel. Remember me? Kimani. What do you want? I've come home. When Richard Brooks did something of value, he managed to get Winston Churchill to do a short prologue. Winston Churchill said, the situation in South Africa is the most important thing in the world today, blah, blah. You know, turning a globe or something, very important. The problems of East Africa are the problems of the world. This was true. 
in 1907. It is true today. But, you know, the studio head said, get rid of the old fat guy, right? It's like, get rid of the old fat guy. It's Winston Churchill. So Winston Churchill got cut out of the picture, right? It's a small bit, but, you know, Churchill had done them a huge favor. So it did Richard Brooks's heart a lot of good to see that put back in the picture. There was a cause for hope in about September 1987 when the rock group bought the Z Channel. And they had very ambitious plans. They came to all the studios and said, we're going to take it national, we need your support, we're going to really grow the subscriber base. The vision was to do a, a sort of sa a national satellite uh, uh, channel that would compete with um, HBO and Showtime. Cherry was happy, he felt like he'd found the right kind of wildcatters the right kind of cowboys that would understand his temperament, and it just the future looked golden. What do they call this place? Just over the rise there, a big town called Tombstone. Fine town. Tombstone? Yeah, I heard of it. Well, me and my brothers might ride in there tonight, get ourselves a shave, maybe. A glass of beer. Yeah, you would enjoy yourself. Wide awake, wide open town, Tombstone. Get anything you want there. Thank you. Okay, any children? No. They had agreed not to have kids. They were both content with it. And there was a point when Jerry made an ironic remark late in 87. He said, well, I could have predicted this would happen. Yeah, you know, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm going to have to go in and have my vasectomy undone. I said, really? What, what's up? And well, Derry wants kids. And, you know, reverse vasectomies, you know, usually don't work. And so there was some frustration going on there between Derry and Jerry. Jerry had told the doctors, look, I, had a, I have a problem. I, have, I used to have a drinking problem. Please don't give me any painkillers after the surgery is over. You know, that way I can recover faster. And they, they agreed. He had the topical anesthetic, but after that he was cold turkey, just surviving it with gritted teeth, the pain of what followed. Unfortunately, an infection followed. And this time, the doctors told him, look, we have to perform the entire operation all over again. And he said, all right, this time you use painkillers, though. He had the binge that he predicted, but he was able to manage it because he saw it coming, and he and Derry went off to Bora Bora and... You know, within a week and a half, he was back up on top. And it was, he arrived from Bora Bora pretty much in time for the stock market crash. Sadly, just after the rock group bought the Z Channel, the stock market went south in a big way in October of 1987. And all those ambitious plans were backburnered. And unfortunately, they were ultimately never realized. I could see the stress, but he really did uh, he, he was more concerned about his staff and that they not be worried or afraid or what have you than he, you know, seemed to be about himself. One night in uh, October of 87, I go to the movies with Jerry and Derry and we watch The Sicilian, directed by Michael Cimino. It's about to come out the next week. It's a preview screening. We're we're watching this film. It's got very witty dialogue. It's got tremendous energy to it. But, you know, the official opinion on Chimino was he's a downer or something. And Jerry said, you know, the two hour, 25 minute cut is actually opening next week in Paris. He said, it is? He said, yeah, I'm going, you know, Derry and I have just made plans to go over. And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm there too. Oh, it was such a wonderful time that we spent there in terms of getting to know them both. It was again to be, you know, in Derry's company, I mean, she just loved being in Paris and it was just all positive and there was a special screening for us because we'd come all this way. And my feeling was that it was one of the three best films of the year, but the film's getting clobbered back in the United States. And when he came back, uh, he called me to tell me that it was back and, and relayed to me how, how upset he was. Uh, I mean, it, it almost went beyond, you know, like you had to say, Jerry, Jerry, relax, calm down. It's, 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 you're making yourself sick over someone else's uh, uh, trials and tribulations. You know, it's, it's, one has to worry about themselves a little more. Stop uh, killing yourself worrying about other, other, other filmmakers' problems. Oh, Verdi. 
Auf Rossini. Auf Caruso. Auf Fitzcarraldo, den Eroberer des Nutzlosen. Auf ihr Wohl. So wahr, wie ich jetzt vor Ihnen stehe, werde ich eines Tages große Oper nach Igidos bringen. Jerry had been receiving these inquiries from Joe Cohen, who was, a, who was a, an executive with Spectacore, which owned Prism, which had had some success back east showing sports and movies, combining them in one channel. And it was Joe's idea that the same could be done for Z Channel. Given the conditions of that month of October, it made, it made a lot of sense. The way to salvage all of this was to add sports programming. And that was it. And thus was born Z Plus, uh, which was everything you love about Z Channel, plus the Dodgers and Angels. The movie The Wild Bunch had a pretty profound effect upon my life. It was about men in a changing world uh, where the values were changing, and they had kind of outlived a, a different world. March 17th of 1988, we all went to Guido's. And that was another great evening. That was like the Parisian trip all over again. This time, Michael Cimino was there. And because I had sort of gone to the wall for the Sicilian, you know, he and I were now very comfortable with each other. And so, you know, we were all, all of us there. And there was a cake that, that Derry had ordered from like this really special bakery. I mean, that's the most amazing chocolate cake I've ever had. And Michael had chosen the inscription, which comes from John Ford, from She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, which is, Lest We Forget. So that was on the cake. And it was Michael's way of thanking, you know, me and Jerry both. And boy, you know, it's so amazing how the fates work because this was the last time we were all together. And, you know, they could not have been more luminous as a pair. We could not have all been happier. I mean, that night is now surrounded by a strange aura for me because it was so happy and we were all so together. And the cake says, lest we forget. One of the risks of taking on a partnership with a sports channel is that, you know, sporting events often run commercials. Because there was this precedent and, and premium or pay television was defined as not having commercials, uh, we um, got into a battle with uh, HBO, and which uh, um, escalated, unfortunately, into a lawsuit. Z Channel felt that uh, HBO had teamed up with four of the studios to prevent Z Channel from getting uh, access to their films. And uh, Z Channel uh, instituted a restraint of trade type lawsuit against them. Jerry was going to be the, the, the star witness uh, in this lawsuit and um, was preparing uh, to testify. When I try to understand what Jerry's state of mind was in the last couple of weeks of his life, I think that it had a lot to do with the fact that he was going up against his friends and old collaborators, old business partners in court. I was, I was quite worried about him the last time I saw him and express concern to my partner and, and anyone else that would listen about it and didn't know what to do, but he seemed th that he was imploding. The night that we inaugurated, um, the sports channel. I mean, they had all these baseball players up at the building, and 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 Jerry and I took a long kind of Socratic walk around the block. We we walked, we circled the block several times, just talking it through. And I was full of dread and apprehension about how things were going to work. And Jerry was being very positive. Jerry was very ill at ease at the party, and he had to say a few words. And um, a lot of us all showed up in support of Jerry up to the end. He was telling me and other people. It's going to be all right. You know, we're going to prevail. It's, you know, it's good. Um, and 
he had the flu. And basically, that was it. He had the flu, he stayed home, and then we did not see him again. My college girlfriend, uh, the day of Jerry's death, saw him wa kind of wandering through the sculpture gardens here at UCLA. Didn't talk to him or anything, but she knew him, and uh, she saw him just kind of walking through the sculpture gardens in a melancholy way the day he died. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure when she saw him, he didn't know it was going to be the day he died. We uh, got a call to come into the office on Sunday. Somebody called me at home and uh, said, you need to come into the office right now. 10 a.m. On, on a Sunday? Yeah, okay, I can be there. Jerry didn't kill himself for an hour after he killed Derry. And I know during that time, the lucid part of him probably resurfaced. I know he called his psychiatrist. I know in a really sort of eerily calm way, he described what he had done to his psychiatrist. And it's interesting, I know Jerry so well that, that I didn't even need to read the police report to corroborate the vision that I had in my head, but I knew he would go to his bed and I knew he would sit down in that spot in a sort of slump position that he always sat in. And I know that he must have spent an hour contemplating what it was that he had done and that he had come to the conclusion that there was just no way that what he had done was acceptable enough to go on living. And he put the gun to his temple and he self-executed himself. I think one of the more painful events in my life was sitting at the breakfast table, cup of tea in front of me, picking up the LA Times, and that's how I learned what happened to Jerry. People are always asking why when something dreadful happens. Truth is, it doesn't matter why. It happened. I was angry at him. Um, I was angry at him for doing that. And I think many other people felt the same way, and that may be one of the reasons this story hasn't been told for so many years. Maybe people needed to go through a healing process for that. But did I see it coming? When Jerry died, his mother called me that day. And a few months after that, I, I started to see her on a regular basis. Maybe I just wanted to know the answer. Maybe there was a reason why everyone at a certain age came to this realization that, you know, they, they'd come from a bad seed. We don't know. And maybe part of my um, association with her was sort of because I I was really curious to know as well, because as much as I pushed Jerry away, I, I wanted to understand the, the story. After Jerry died, it was right at the time, within a week or two, of when Z Channel started broadcasting sports. And um, I guess you could say Z Channel died when Jerry died. Z Channel died when sports came on. Well, there was a year between Jerry's death and the end of Z Channel. Um, so while those events were certainly uh, clearly linked in people's minds, uh, they weren't directly linked, perhaps. We were showing The Silence by Igmar Bergman the end, very climactic scene. It's, it's all about the quest for God. Is there God or is there just silence? And here we reach, you know, the, the climax of the movie. 
Then comes on at the bottom of the frame a yellow Chiron that says, Don't miss the Dodgers game coming up next at 7 o'clock on Z Channel. Well, The Z Channel was really about content. Here's, here's what we love. We love movies, and here's a whole bunch of them, and here's some really interesting people talking about them. To be included within all these great filmmakers and, and to hopefully have opened somebody else's eyes out there, you know I mean? Because that's what Z Channel did do, just show the ordinary film goer that there was a whole other world out there. And um, so I, I feel very privileged to be a part of that. There's been no place since, in my mind, that has done quite what Z Channel's done in sort of bringing all different kinds of film together in a way that, that uh, really brings out the best in films by, by showing it in a context of, of everything that, that is movies. The Z Channel being what it was and being a remarkable achievement, if you compare that with what Jerry eventually did and how he died and what he did prior to his death. There's this sense of creating a hero where perhaps one is inappropriate. And I had, I had problems with that. Whatever, I think, sort of positive feelings there were about Jerry at that point, and it sort of trumped everything. You, you, you weren't going to get around the fact that he murdered his wife. I had a feeling in my mind that Jerry had other options, that there was other options for him. Um, that doesn't make it right. I'm not saying anything about how you leave this earth or don't leave this earth. I just always had in the back of my mind, still do, that there was, he had other options. They, they can't be diminished when, we're, we're, when we all stand up and have to say our names about who Who's responsible for, the, for this piece of shit <laughs> or this masterpiece? Who's responsible? You know, everybody wants to take credit, but he was um, a, an intricate part of all of those films that he touched. Even though he had nothing to do with them when they were made, he, there was still a living uh, nurturing that brought those films that otherwise I think would have lost forever. I like him. Louise Brooks, one of Jerry's favorite actresses and one of mine, always liked to quote Goethe. Goethe would say, a human life remains of consequence not because of what we leave behind, but because we act and inspire and rouse others. <sighs> Damn it. Sorry. Um, a human life remains of consequence not because of what we leave behind, but because we act and inspire and rouse others to action and inspiration. We act and inspire and rouse others to action and enjoyment. And so when I think of the legacy of Jerry Harvey's life, I think of it in those terms. I think, you know, he's not a guy who left much behind. What he left behind was, in a lot of way, wreckage and very tragic and costly wreckage. The films that got left behind that he midwifed are part of the action and inspiration of his life. He acted and inspired others to value these things of beauty. You're listening to Castaway's Choice. I'm John McNally. Our castaway this week is Jerry Harvey, who is the program director of Group W's Z Channel. Why did you choose What Will I Do? Well, for me, for me it's, it's, it's the greatest love song. Is that simple? Huh? Yeah. so divine tis broken and cannot be mended you must go your way and I must go mine but now that our love dream
Thank you. 